we can continue to study the power and promise of resurrection, God's power and promise. As I said this morning, today's lessons form a bridge. We've been thinking about what, what God can do and what God has done. Why should it be thought incredible by anyone that God can raise the dead? Paul asked in Acts chapter 26, verse 8. If there is a God with the power and the wisdom to create the whole universe and to create human life, why wouldn't he have the power to raise people from the dead? What's wrong with having it down here, Tony? Why wouldn't God have the power to raise people from the dead? Before the crucifixion of Jesus, a half dozen people were brought back to life by God whenever they were obviously dead. And God showed his compassion in that as well. And then Jesus rose from the dead, but that was a resurrection like no other. Those women who received their dead back in resurrection, Hebrews chapter 11 says, they looked forward to a better resurrection. Jesus experienced a better resurrection. Romans chapter 6 verse 9 says that we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death has no dominion over him. So Jesus is risen from the dead, and and we've looked at evidences for that over the last couple of weeks. And these lessons this morning and tonight are about evidence, again, because people were witnesses, but then we're crossing the bridge to not just the what, but the so what. So Jesus is risen from the dead. So what? Well, in, in Peter... In James and Paul, we see that there's transforming power in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We're going to begin tonight in Matthew chapter 13. This morning we thought about Peter as the first member of a transformed trio of men. He went from undependable to unshakable because he saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified. Tonight we're going to think about James. The Bible features at least three men, maybe four in the New Testament story, who were named James. We want to pinpoint which one we're talking about tonight by looking at Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 to 58. It says, And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. There are several things that that would be news to some people with the limited knowledge of Jesus from this paragraph. In Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, people did not know at this point what to make of it. This was a boy who had grown up here, hometown boy. And they'd been around him his whole life. And they know his family. So what is all of this? He didn't, go, he didn't go to college and be trained as a rabbi. What's he doing teaching all of this stuff? And as they name off who are the members of his family we learn a little more about the family in which he grew up. Some people have have been given the false idea that Mary was always a a virgin. She she gave birth to Jesus as a virgin because of the power of the Holy Spirit, and they think, well, that's the way it always was with her, and that's a Catholic doctrine that's really, really important. 
But we find out here that Jesus in the home of Joseph and Mary was just the first of at least eight children. This was a house that was just overflowing with kids. He has brothers, they're all named, and this talks about all his sisters. That sounds like at least three to me. But one brother who's named in particular is James. So that's how we establish from the first that Jesus had a brother named James. In his hometown, people didn't know what to make of Jesus. But in that household, not everybody knew what to make of Jesus. Turn over to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, we find out a little more about what at least some of Jesus' adult siblings were thinking about him during his ministry. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says, then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Now that might tell us a little bit about some of the stories that get told about Jesus as a child. We don't know anything about Jesus as a child, except from right back there at his birth and close to it. And then what happened over the space of a couple of days when he was 12 years old at the temple in Jerusalem. Beyond that, we just don't know. Some, some books that purport to be about Jesus and, and to be accurate tell things that are really different about him than what we learn from him about Scripture, that he, he did some outrageous, miraculous type things that just don't sound anything like the miracles he did, but that he did these things while he was a child. I'm not going to tell you about any of those right now because they're not for real. But apparently, nothing about being a brother or a sister physically to Jesus and growing up in that home led them to believe that what he's out here doing in his ministry is what he was always meant to do. This is who he is. And everybody needs to have faith in him. They didn't think that. They're thinking... He's out of his mind. That's interesting, isn't it? And now for a little more about that, look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, For not even his brothers believed in him. Not even his brothers believed in him. We'd read earlier, they sought to seize him because he was out of his mind. And then you read this and we find out Jesus was an embarrassment to his siblings. Now, one thing that we ought to note that I read from apologist J.P. Moreland is that in ancient Judaism, it was highly embarrassing for a rabbi's family not to accept him. And therefore, the gospel writers have no motive for fabricating this skepticism if it weren't true. There are all kinds of things surrounding the identity of Jesus and his resurrection that would not have been written by people who were making up a story. We talked about one. They wouldn't have made women the first witnesses at the tomb, the empty tomb, and the first to see Jesus alive because the evidence was not accepted in legal matters and such in the first century when it was offered by women. That was the culture. Women aren't trustworthy. And then here you have writers trying to convince us of the divine identity of Jesus 
as they say, not even his brothers believed in him. That would not have happened if John was making up a story. They really didn't believe in him. These were the people who'd known Jesus all his life, almost. Well, maybe this attitude of his family has something to do, maybe everything to do, with what you remember happened at the cross with some of Jesus' last words as he asked John or, or told John, take care of my mom, basically. Jesus didn't think he could count on his brother. So that's the background for this man, James, in relation to his brother, Jesus. So things change. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Jesus has already been crucified by this time. He's already been buried. And many have seen him alive, according to the Scripture's testimony. We come to Acts chapter 1, verse 12, and it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem. That's the apostles. Jesus had told them, You go and wait in Jerusalem. That's what he told them as he ascended back into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, two men, really three named James, are are mentioned as Luke enumerates. Who was there? There were two apostles named James, at least. There was James, who was the brother of John, both of them sons of Zebedee. There was James, who was the son of Alphaeus. And there's another guy, Judas, who was the son of James. But they're all gathered together. Not only these apostles, but there were the women who followed Jesus during his mystery or ministry. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And there were his brothers. Now, you might understand his brothers being there if this gathering was a grief support group. That's not what it was at all. This was an assembly of people who were anticipating now even better things. These were mostly people who had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And among them there are Jesus' brothers. We already learned, John chapter 7, verse 5, that during his ministry they didn't believe in him. But now here they are, numbered among this small group of of believers. And as we keep reading the book of Acts, we come to chapter 12, chapter 15, and chapter 21, and someone named James is a leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's a preacher, probably a pastor or an elder, and in the words of Paul in Galatians 2 verse 9, he's just a pillar of the church. Which James was it? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul calls him James, the Lord's brother. So it's this guy that we met back there in Matthew chapter 13. Things have changed with him. James would go on to write a book of the New Testament, and he introduces himself in that book, James chapter 1, verse 1, as James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who am I? I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? I thought the brother of Jesus did not believe that Jesus was the Lord and Christ. What happened? Well, when we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning, we saw verse 7, and that's the key. Jesus was raised from the dead, and the Bible says he appeared to James. James was transformed to the point that he, like Peter, even died for his devotion to Jesus. 
as Christ, as risen Lord. The Jewish historian Josephus from the late first century, who was not a Christian, said that James was stoned to death on account of his unwavering faith in his brother Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't take us that far in James' story, but here's somebody who was not a Christian who says, this is James, and this is what happened to him. Five more sources that were written by the end of the second century tell the same story about James. He went from not believing in his brother's identity, true identity at all, to believing in him, to the point that he would die upon his insistence that Jesus is risen from the dead. From unbelieving to unashamed, James was transformed by the power of the resurrection of Christ. That's what happened to Peter. That's what happened to James. Let's think for just a little while about Paul. There's more to be told about Paul and his transformation, but we're going to limit ourselves for the sake of time, especially to a few verses in the book of Acts. So keep turning over to the end of chapter 7. Here's where we meet him. Stephen is becoming the first man to die for his insistence that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead. And... In the process, verse 58 of John Acts chapter 7 says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses of that stoning laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Keep reading into chapter 8. And Saul approved of his death. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Who was Saul? Saul was no less than a a rising star on the scene of Jewish religion. Here's what he said about himself at this point in his life. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning of verse 5, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul was all out for what he thought Judaism was supposed to be, and he was all out against Jesus and the church. He believed that Jesus was a brazen imposter, not the real Messiah, and that people who followed Jesus, Christians, were blameworthy imbeciles. This story of what's about to happen to Paul is told a couple of more times in Acts, and on one of those occasions, whenever Paul is telling it himself, he talks about the kind of man that he was. Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That was Saul. But then something happened. So we pick up his story in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. 
The Bible says that Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. Now, we could mine those few verses for a lot of wonderful truth, but for those of you who've never really studied before, look at how personally Jesus takes how people are treating his people. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, Jesus is risen from the dead. He ascended back to heaven in Luke chapter 24 and in Acts chapter 1. How is Paul persecuting Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us he's persecuting the church. The church is the body of Christ. And when the body feels it, Jesus feels it. When the body experiences it, Jesus experiences it. And he's come to set us all straight. Verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now we ought to point out again to people who are just beginning to study this, Paul doesn't get in any kind of good mood on the road to Damascus. Paul was not converted on the road to Damascus. Paul saw Jesus here, but that didn't mean he was a Christian now. He had an incredible experience that's never been repeated again in all the time since then, but he still wasn't a Christian. He goes into Damascus blind, so upset that for three days he doesn't eat or drink. Verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise, go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord... I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I'll show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Now those last few words especially are just pregnant with meaning, and some of the meaning is filled in later on in the book of Acts. Acts 22, verse 16, when Paul's retelling the story, he tells us a little more of what Ananias told him. He said, and now what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You mean Saul's sins hadn't been washed away on the road to Damascus? No, they had not. They waited for Saul to be saved the same way that Jesus saves everybody. 
Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So the Bible tells us in verse 18 that, that Paul obeyed that command. He was baptized. And, and then what's he ready for immediately? He's ready for something to eat. He's ready for something to drink. That knot that had been there in his stomach for three days is untied. Something good is now happening in his life. As we continue the reading, the rest of verse 18 says, For some days, or verse 19, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Now remember, he went there to round up those disciples at Damascus take them back to Jerusalem to be punished. But he's with those disciples. Verse 20, And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And that's the way it was the rest of his life. But that's not all that would characterize the rest of his life. The next few verses say that there are still some people who were like what Saul had been. And now nobody is in their crosshairs like Saul is. They're out to get him. And it'll be that way for the rest of his life because he's saying that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, as we read this morning, Paul said, And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. I'm the last one he appeared to, he says, and I didn't deserve it. I persecuted the church of God. J.P. Moreland again said, suddenly, in Acts chapter 9, he doesn't just ease off of Christians, he joins their movement. And more than that, he's a powerful proclaimer of Christ. Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 23 that, that the people who were first hearing about what was different in him said he preaches the faith that he once tried to destroy. There were people like he used to be who were never going to let Saul rest for this. He suffered and he suffered and he suffered at their hands, but he would not stop doing the job that Jesus had given him to do. Jesus appeared to him for a specific purpose. He's told a little bit about it here in Acts chapter 9. We read about it again in Acts 22 and Acts chapter 26. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, Paul asked the Corinthians, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? Why did Jesus appear to Saul? Not to save him. He still had to do what you and I have to do in order to be saved. But he appeared to him to make another witness. Just like Peter. Just like James. Now Paul is a witness. By the time Paul writes his last letter, 2 Timothy, he can see that that death is coming, and coming fast. How did it end for him? Well, again, the Bible doesn't tell his story all the way to the end. But get outside the Bible, and again, back to that letter of 1 Clement, as we mentioned this morning, a letter written from a church in Rome to another church. And they give a reminder about Paul. They talk about all that Paul suffered and how he died for his faith in Christ. First Clement tells that 
case of Paul's martyrdom. And so do seven more surviving sources that are written before the second century. Now, why do I keep mentioning all of that today? Well, it's because we look at the Bible, and you and I, we know this is where we need to get our information. And it's trustworthy as trustworthy can be. But some people aren't convinced. Well, of course that's what it says. That's what it's supposed to say about the hero. But sources outside the Bible confirm Jesus really lived. Sources outside the Bible confirm Jesus really died by crucifixion. Sources outside the Bible suggest that Jesus appeared to his disciples, at least that that's what his disciples believed. And sources outside the Bible say that they were so transparent in that conviction and they were so convicted that they would die saying that's what happened and that they would die before they would ever deny that that was the truth. Jesus is really risen from the dead and it totally transformed the people who saw him alive after they knew he had been dead. In Paul's case, he went from inconvincible to unstoppable, all because of the resurrection of Christ. Now, here's how I want to finish up tonight. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, he said, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus He's telling us you can't be an apostle unless you have seen Jesus. But what about a Christian? Can you be a Christian? Can you be a faithful one? Can your faith be reasonable if you've never seen Jesus? I'll remind you again of what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter can write to other Christians in the first century And be confident you have not seen him. That everybody in his reading audience, where this letter was originally sent, who was a Christian, had not seen Jesus alive. He said, though you've not seen him, you love him. And you're going to obtain the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Not every Christian in the first century had seen Jesus alive. Are you going to see Jesus? Not the way that Peter did. Not the way that James did. Not the way that Paul did. Not in this life. It is not God's plan that we will see Jesus in this life. But you will see him on resurrection day when he comes again. Now, can you believe that? Can you believe in him without seeing him now? Jesus wants you to believe his witnesses. There was Peter, there was James, there was Paul. There were those women. We read it this morning. At, at, at just one time, there were more than 500 people who saw him. Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Christ, wants us to, to think about that. Without question, he said, the amount of testimony and corroboration of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances is staggering. To put it into perspective, if you were to call each one of the witnesses to a court of law to be cross-examined for just 15 minutes each, and you went around the clock without a break, It would take you from at least breakfast on Monday until dinner on Friday to hear them all. 
After listening to 129 straight hours of eyewitness testimony, who could possibly walk away unconvinced? I cannot. Can you? The evidence is there. Jesus is risen from the dead. And part of the evidence is this transformed trio. They changed in a way that's just un- inexplicable, except that Jesus is risen from the dead. Do you believe? Do you trust Jesus? Will you trust and obey Him? If you'll do that, there's transformation coming into your life as well. We've heard tonight what God told Ananias to tell Saul about how to be saved. Is that what you need to do tonight, to be baptized? Has your faith wavered lately? And has that shown up in the way you've lived your life? Jesus is risen from the dead. and In our first lesson, we saw that that means he's going to be the judge of us all. And we want to meet him with a good conscience, the kind that only comes from being cleansed by his blood. He wants to keep us clean, and he will keep us clean if we'll confess our sin, walk in the lights, he is in the light. You need to answer the Lord's invitation. It's for you tonight. Come while we stand and sing together.